Hey, found out that both John Shimkus and I own Malibu's, uh, made in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, a fine automobile, I would say. Uh, have you have has the Shimkus family enjoyed its Malibu? Uh, we have it's Karen's primary car, and uh, we got a Ford Focus, and I have that my still the the van, the Chrysler Town and Country. So that's our three vehicles. All right, there you go. And you've got a uh, how many drivers in the family now? Three. Three. Ooh, <laughs> That's the two. Of- I'm not sure if the other one qualifies us. I mean, legally he does. But uh. <laughs> let's go to the phone. Starting with Robin on line one. Robin, Congressman John Shimkus is our guest. Hello. Hello there. Hey, I was at a town hall meeting for small businessmen not too long ago, and one of their concerns was about all the regulations um, from the government that holds their businesses down. And um, what concerns me is this cap and trade that it would just bring out more regulations for these small businesses. What does the congressman think about that? Well, briefly, briefly, uh, she's right on. The Senate bill is going to have a, a fuel tax, which just would increase tax versus uh, uh, there will be a cap-and-trade program for the point source uh, generate. But let me let me mention this. You want to talk about new regulations. Just think if you've got a small business, and for every aggregate total over $600, you have to send a 1099 to the purchasee. That's part of this new health care bill. So let's say you cut grass and you buy $600 worth of gasoline at some gas station. You have to send them. An equivalent of 1099. That's why there's 15,000 new IRS employees are going to be hired to to help control this new health care bill. Explain that again. If I landscape <laughs> lawns and I buy gasoline from the mobile mini mart o- over the course of a year, I have to send them a 1099? If it's over $600. And it will be? Yes. Unless that's... I shop around and buy gasoline at different places so I can avoid that. And, and, that and that's so the government can can track who's paying who money so you can find out full-time employees or full-time equivalent employees based upon making sure these folks have health care. Well, you know, uh, I happen to be in favor of more government regulation when it comes to the oil rigs in the Persian Gulf, in um, the Gulf of Mexico. It seems to me that the Minerals Management Service was not doing its job when it came to overseeing some of those rigs. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a big all the above energy guy. I'm an OCS guy. I'm a drill person. I like. Are, coal. are you still the drill person? I, I am. Uh, but these folks, just like if you believe in the competitive market model, they need to be held accountable. And and all these costs need to come out of BP's pocket and their show hurdles because because they also neglected their responsibilities. John, it seems to me, if. Um California's already changed its views on drilling. So has Virginia. Uh, Louisiana's gonna. And if the oil slick is going toward Texas, I can only think that there will be a movement away from drilling off the Texas shore uh, because these spills cause a lot of damage, and you might say it's emotional, not uh, logical. I think we're going to see less offshore or offshore drilling. And we and we could very well. But what then we have to have still all the above energy, which means let's go to nuclear power. Let's take Illinois coal. Let's turn that coal into liquid fuel, which the Germans did in in the in World War II. So there are things we can do, but we need to incentivize that and ensure we want to be we want to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil. Well, how about let's just go in where there's and not doing outer continental shelf drilling. Let's open up the natural gas reserves that we have in Utah. And, and explore the ones in Pennsylvania that they're just found. I mean, there are things we can do if we have to move off the outer continental shelf, so be it. I always think there will be a price when energy gets so high that you eventually get these resources. David's next on KMOX. Hi, David. Uh, hi, Charlie. Hey, Congressman, a quick question. Um, how is America ever going to be you know, competitive in the private sector when we spend a trillion, like, a trillion dollars a year on defense while our, the next biggest defense budget is the Chinese who spend about a tenth of what we do. I think our spending is about $650 billion. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, and Gates is just start, starting to talk about cutting an additional $10 billion from the Department of Defense. You know, Newt Gingrich always said, you know, the Pentagon should be a triangle. I, I do think that there's probably huge efficiencies if you look at the military industrial complex that Eisenhower talked about and how do you streamline that process. But we we are still the only force for good in the world, and we're the only ones who can deploy, whether it's uh, uh, in in Indonesia for tsunamis. It's our military that does that because Mm -hmm. of of its strength. We are the only ones who who run to the sound of the guns around the world. Well, there was a time when we could afford that, but 
Congressman, aren't we seeing now some of our most recent terrorist attacks, like uh, the Fort Hood massacre, where the fella operated based on orders from Yemen, and now the failed attempt in uh, Times Square in New York City, where the guy was working on orders from Pakistan. The terrorism is here now. Right. And maybe it's time for us to get the heck out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, I think the issue is asymmetric warfare. and But remember, Afghanistan, the September 11th attackers were trained, protected, funded from the safe havens in Afghanistan. This guy was trained where? In the safe havens of the Pakistan, the same area, just on the different side of the mountain range. Uh, and and uh, that's, I mean, that's why I still believe you have to have somewhat of national control, not by us, but by the Afghanistan government and the Pakistan government. And they need to know that we're allies and trying to clean up these safe havens. Well, that's the opinion of Congressman John Shimkus. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, you're heading to Lambert. It seems as though there are fewer flights from Lambert around the country. Has service to D.C. been affected? Uh, I think we've lost a flight or so. There's still four or five a day. Uh, sometimes I can get out of Dulles late at night. We can't get out late out of, of Reagan. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think to some extent. But there's, you know, business is booming in Washington, D.C. You know, the government's growing. Did I read when I was there in late March that the D.C. area, just greater Washington, D.C., added 163,000 new jobs since the recession began in 2008. I don't know if that's amount, but I always say if you want to find a job, you go to D.C. If you want to make sure your housing values don't tube, the D.C. area is the place to be. Well, that's why a lot of these booming cities like Columbus and Madison, uh, Indianapolis, Austin are all state capitals. Right. And, and there you got, that's where the money is. That's where the money is. Government. Hey, John, thanks a lot. Good, good to be with Charlie. 